The United States brought a resolution regarding a ceasefire in Gaza to the UN Security Council. Now Russia and China vetoed it. To those who are observing this issue, who have been observing this issue, it might seem surprising. For instance, the US in the past has vetoed resolutions calling for ceasefires, while the other permanent members have continuously demanded such ceasefires. So what was this resolution about? What was the devil in the details? And why was it vetoed? We go to Abdul for an answer to these questions. Abdul, thank you for joining us. A lot of discussion around this so-called ceasefire resolution, allegations being thrown uh, on from both sides. But of course, I guess the devil is in the details and what exactly is the ceasefire resolution is the uh, million dollar question. So, what exactly did the US, United States bring to the uh, Security Council? Well, Prashant, uh, this was, you can say, a kind of a, a US attempt to basically wash its own uh, whatever... Uh, problems it had had and uh, basically in the last four months, five months of the war, when it had vetoed at least three times the resolutions which were presented earlier to asking for ceasefire. All the time, US had claimed that it it, it is not uh, pressurizing Israel because uh, it stands with Israel, uh, uh, whatever objectives are there uh, in Gaza, and hence uh, it was supporting the uh, Israel's moves, despite claiming that it is for humanitarian uh, uh, aid and uh, wants to uh, minimize the casualties which are uh, related to civilians, primarily the children and women. So uh, uh, the resolution it presented, uh, it seems after a lot of uh, 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 pressure from uh, b from within the US because of the popular pressure and become the global community, but still wanted to protect the interest of the interest of Israel. If you see the resolution's uh, text, it simply says that uh, it talks about the need of a ceasefire, does not talk about how there should be a ceasefire or does not demand a ceasefire that there should be a ceasefire even for a short period it says that there should be a, 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 there there is a need for a ceasefire and there should be uh, the international attempts which are being made should be supported by all the parties and therefore that would lead to if there is a possibility that would lead to a ceasefire in return if uh, 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 Palestinian side, particularly Hamas, should be ready to release all the hostages it has had, and 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 therefore it does not. Uh, of course, it talks about uh, uh, increased access to of humanitarian aid and so on and so forth. But apart from these three things, it does not say anything else. So it does not ask for, does not demand for a ceasefire, and and uh, expects that Hamas should release all the uh, hostages if there is a temporary ceasefire agreed uh, for. That would mean if there, there is a see, uh, Israel uh, decides that the temporary period is over and tries to restart uh, the war uh, against Palestinians in Gaza, then that, that, is, that would be justified. So that was a text which basically was opposed by uh, uh, Russia and China. They were saying Algeria that there... Of course, Algeria, uh, one another country, Guyana, also uh, abstained. So uh, these four countries, primarily in a in a way, were opposed to the, this idea that we should leave the possibility of a ceasefire on the peace negotiations which are going on, and we all know the uncertainty of of it, uh, given the fact that Israel has repeatedly refused to engage with the Palestinians on the ground of any permanent ceasefire, demands of any permanent ceasefire. So uh, uh, because of the vagueness of the language, because it's a, a complete um, uh, responsibility putting on Palestinian side, uh, the, uh, uh, it seems that China and uh, Russia decided to veto it and Algeria also voted against uh, the resolution. Right, Abdul, of course, in this context, would you also maybe take us through what is happening on the ground? Because one of the concerns raised by many of these countries were it does not address the question of the assault on Rafa also, or the potential assault on Rafa. Exactly. See, Israel has repeatedly said that despite the pressure, despite if even if there is a, a international uh, consensus that there should not be any attack on Rafa, Israel will carry out a ground offensive. Uh, when? Of course, they are not saying when, but it will carry out 
a, a ground offensive in Rafah. There are already uh, uh, bombings. Uh, several bombings have been reported inside Rafah, including a bombing uh, on Friday. Uh, uh, even on uh, Saturday, there are reports of uh, attacks on uh, some parts of Rafah, and and there are number of people who have died. So every day around. Uh, uh, 50 plus people are being killed inside Rafah alone. Uh, so uh, it seems that Israel, uh, uh, despite the fact that it knows that there are more than 1.3, almost 1.5 million Palestinians are staying in that small territory, um, any bombing will lead to large scale uh, 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 casualties. Uh, Israel is carrying out bombing and it is, uh, it is determined to carry out ground offensive. So even the resolution does not say that, as I said before, that it tomorrow after, say, a temporary ceasefire is agreed and all the hostages are released, there would, there would be a no attack on Rafa. And knowing the fact that uh, any attack on Rafa ground offensive particularly would be disastrous. The number of Palestinians who have been killed so far, uh, more than 32,000, may multiply many times if... Uh, a ground offensive like what happened in Khan Yunis or in northern Gaza is taken. So uh, despite that uh, possibility, there is no mention of uh, uh, a permanent ceasefire in the resolution. And uh, therefore, uh, as uh, Russia and China were claiming that the non-permanent members uh, uh, have, have uh, drafted a new resolution which talks about uh, clearly talks about uh, permanent ceasefire of course it talks about release of hostages and, and so on and so forth but it also talks about a permanent ceasefire that would mean there will be no ground offensive to rafa and therefore they are trying to mobilize support for it uh, we are not sure whether it, uh, us will support such resolution, given the, the given the track record, as I said before, three times they have already vetoed, and uh, they are still not very sure about a uh, 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 permanent ceasefire inside uh, Gaza, and therefore uh, the possible uh, the future of that draft resolution prepared by the non permanent members is also uncertain. Right, Abdul, thank you so much for that update. India said to conduct vital elections in April and May, which will determine the fate of the Narendra Modi-led government. A lot of policies and questions are at stake and the direction the country will take in the next five years will be determined by these elections. Now, a key question is of health policy. If there is anything that COVID-19 has taught us, it is how decisions taken by bureaucrats and ministers can affect our lives and deaths. And we are a long way away from being governed by the right kind of policies. Recently, a group of health activists in India released a manifesto which asked political parties to commit to certain aspects of health policy. We go to Jyotsna for more on these details. Jyotsna, thank you so much for joining us. So, a very important manifesto because health policy uh, among, and many other policy decisions often uh, don't really come up for discussion during elections. Those are not the topics leaders talk about. But those topics do have a vital influence on our day-to-day -day lives. COVID, of course, proving at, uh, the best example of that kind of an impact. So, maybe could you give us an overview of the health, you know, why a health manifesto is necessary? What are the kind of contexts uh, in, uh, in today in the India's health policy scenario? Yeah, uh, thanks for uh, inviting Prashant. So, uh, you're right. I mean, health is very important. But we also know that health has never been a very political issue. And we have not really seen that in any elections. It is a specifically health which really swings the elections or doesn't. But at the same time, I think the People's Health Movement India, uh, as a part of that, we all believe that since COVID, health has become an issue that people talk about in a day-to-day -day lives and it has become more political than before. Also, the kind of devastation that was created during uh, COVID-19, especially in countries uh, of the global south, such as India, uh, it is very important that uh, the governments realize how important it is to prioritize uh, health and not just the governments, but all the political parties who are going to fight elections, uh, that health has to be taken up as a major issue. Um, so with that kind of an understanding, we have gone ahead and launched a health manifesto, which basically is uh, consists of policy proposals, which we are requesting political parties to include in their commitments uh, while going to the people asking for their votes and, um, um, and have those commitments been fulfilled because some of them will uh, represent us in the parliament in the coming days and they should fulfill some obligations um, that um, as elected representatives they would have in terms of how 
health of people uh, should be governed and uh, and their access to proper and quality and free health care. Right. Joshua, in this context, of course, could you maybe go into a bit to specifics and tell us what are some of the concrete recommendations that this manifesto makes, that this manifesto asks political parties to include? Yes. Uh, so if you see overall title of the manifesto is Our Health, Our Right. So obviously it is very much rooted in an understanding that health is a fundamental right as opposed to which we see. Uh, and again, as I said, we see we saw during COVID times, it is not a commercial product. Health is not business. Health is not commerce. Health is a fundamental right. And coming from that understanding, there are a lot of changes we need to do the way uh, health is provided, healthcare is provided in the country. Um, so but within that, I think one of our major demands is a common system of healthcare delivery for all. So, for example, if we see the super rich in India have a particular kind of hospitals and the way health systems work for them. Then there is middle class. There are a different range of hospitals altogether uh, that the middle class goes to and the treatment also differs there. And then you have uh, the poorest sections who have uh, have to depend on a very different kind of health system which government provided but if it is not uh, coming but because it is not easy to access health even in the government system then you have uh, uh, other alternate uh, medicines or as we call jhola chap doctors who are not really trained in medicine but they can just provide you some basic relief and uh, somebody who sits next door uh, who provides you uh, some kind of a the uh, solution to the problem you are going through or in fact coming off a, a lot of irrational practices right. uh, that you can be treated with this because it is uh, difficult for people to access health uh, in lack of money and resources. So there are different systems of health for different classes of people. Now that should not exist. There has to be a standard way of treatment and everybody should have access to it. And if we start to move towards that, that is what we are saying in terms of common health and health standards for all. So this is one of the major things. And uh, then, of course, uh, a strengthening of the public health care system should be there. We are absolutely saying that we do not want insurance schemes. The way insurance schemes are being again and again promoted, it is a problem uh, on because of various reasons. One, um, if it is a government provided insurance scheme and you empanel private hospitals, so actually the taxpayer's money is going to the private sector um, and uh, for treatment. The government should use that money to strengthen the public infrastructure so that everybody has uh, access to it. And of course, there is more accountability being government. Um, discrimination, stigma, vis-a-vis -vis certain types of populations, that should go away. Gender is very much rooted within our entire health manifesto that women and sexual minorities, um, uh, they have certain specific needs that should be reflected in uh, political parties' commitments, such as gender-based uh, violence. It should become a major health issue. Um, so, uh, and uh, to achieve all of this, actually what the government needs to do is to increase um, its uh, uh, spending on health. So if we see public spending on health is among the lowest in the world. So what government spends and uh, uh, is something like in India, 21 US dollars per person per year. You compare it to many other countries such as Thailand, Brazil, uh, South Africa, they are spending as much as four times to 10 times more uh, than this much money on their people. So uh, we should aim for that. So what we are saying is that, uh, so the government in 2017 policy, the health policy had said uh, they will increase government budget uh, to, I mean, the percentage of gross domestic uh, product GDP of uh, India uh, to 2.5%. Right now, uh, the government is spending something like one or 1.2% of its money on uh, health, but it should spend as much as 2.5. That is the government's promise. We are saying in the next five years, they should increase it to 3.5%. And going forward, the final demand is, which uh, according to the WHO should be the spending on uh, health, that is 5% of the GDP. So the entire money that government has, uh, 3.5 for the next five years, and 5% after that uh, should be spent on public health. Josta, thank you so much for those details on a very important manifesto ahead of the intellections. We'll keep tracking some of these issues in the coming episodes as well.
That's all we have in this episode of Daily Debrief. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. Meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.